Well, hello, TEDx Melbourne. Great to see you out there. I'm thrilled to be here to talk about something I'm passionate about and something that I've been thinking long and hard about over the past couple of years and working on also. It's around ideas to transform the way we move, innovations for the transport sector. So we all know here in Australia that our transport sector is built on the private car. In fact, in Australia, we have one of the highest per capita rates of private car ownership anywhere in the world. We're up there at number two or three behind our friends in the US with the highest, as number one with the highest number of cars per capita. Now, the private car has offered us so much, and particularly in a vast country like Australia. It's enabled us to link our cities and towns, get to amazing places in this beautiful country, to keep connected with our families, to, to have work and travel opportunities, and build our economy. So it's been fundamental to this success of Australia. And indeed, historians have noted that Henry Ford freed the common people from the limitations of their geography. However, despite all these fabulous things and all of the benefits of private car ownership, there's been some unintended costs, things we didn't really intend to happen, but they are. So what are some of those? Well, we heard today there's an issue with the way our cars are powered. They burn fossil fuels and they emit CO2 emissions. We know that we've got a peak oil issue and we know that we have an excess of CO2 in the atmosphere is a big issue. Scientists have been telling us for a long time now that excess CO2 in the atmosphere is going to change our climate and is going to mean that many of the places where we currently live and produce food, we're no longer going to be able to do that. And if the scientists are right, the impacts could be much more catastrophic than that. So obviously we need to look at how we power this great machine a different way. However, I'm not sure that just powering our cars a different way is going to be enough. There's been a few other unintended consequences of the private car. The private car costs us about $13 billion in lost productivity to our economy through traffic congestion each year. And worse still, it costs us $17 billion to, in our economy through the impacts of road trauma. But there's one other thing that I would like to talk to about, about from the, imp the impact that cars are having. So climate change is a grave and pressing issue, but I think it's just one issue of a much larger issue, a larger issue around overconsumption. And I think we're going to see more and more symptoms of this bigger issue, climate change just being one and quite prominent for us in the public debate here in Australia at the moment. But another issue of overconsumption is obesity. Clearly, it's the result of us eating too much. Or, but it is also the result of us not being as active. And I believe the private car contributes to our sedentary lifestyles and is impacting on obesity rates. And if you, again, if you, look at the, if, if you look at the tables, you'll see Australia up there, up at the top, following our friends in the US again, as one of the most obese countries in the world. The statistics are that up to 60% of adult Australians are overweight or obese. And what's particularly sad is it's growing in our children. The rates of obesity growth in children is phenomenal. Our children are no longer walking to school, riding a bike. Instead, they're being transported there in a CO2-emitting machine that's adding to their waistlines. It's a bit of a sad story. So what can we do about this if we need to look at how, we, how this great machine that did so much for us is having all of these negative consequences? Some people say invest in public transport. Sure, we need to invest in public transport. We need, we need an, alternative to, an alternative to private transport's consumption, and public transport has been traditionally the collective consumption of transport. 
But we need more than that, because studies have shown, even if you've got a great public transport system, like somewhere like Switzerland, if you still own a car, you're going to travel in that car for trips you shouldn't otherwise use it for, just because you've got it sitting out the front. So it's not just about investing in public transport. We need something else to make the, make the change. So I'd like to borrow a concept from the health sector, given the, given the connection I'm making between transport, consumption, CO2 and obesity. You might know, you might remember, the good food pyramid. It's a triangle with all the things at the bottom being the things that you should eat every day and regularly, through to those that you should eat moderately a few times a week, and to those at the top which you should be only eat sparingly. So how would this look for a good mobility pyramid? Number one, active transport. Transport that burns calories, but not fossil fuels. So that's walking and cycling. We need to do more of it. And we need to stop driving the car to the gym to stand on a treadmill or a stationary bike it's insane. It's the same issue as our kids not, not walking and cycling to school. Let's get out there and let's do it. So we need to rethink the way we design our cities. We need our amenities, shops, schools designed closer to us and not in a spread out urban sprawl. But I do want to just draw a fine point on walking. The importance of walking should not go unnoticed to us here today. We're gathered on the banks of the Yarra River, a significant and important place for the Kula Nation, of cultural heritage to the Wurundjeri people. And you will note that for 50,000 years, Indigenous people in this country did nothing more than walk gently on the land. They had no excess CO2 emissions and not an obesity problem. So in acknowledging and paying my respects to the traditional owners of the land today, I'd encourage us to take their lead as the traditional custodians of the land and make walking the main form of transport. So active transport's number one. Number two is an expanded, integrated public transport system. Now we currently think of public transport uh, as the traditional bus, tram, train. We need much more than that if that system is going to compete with the private car. So what else was going to be in the mix? Well, we need bikes to be, be in the mix. And yes, we do have a public bike share scheme here in Melbourne, but sadly, it's not booming like the public bike share schemes around the world. Now, I think that has a lot to do with our mandatory helmet laws. And that's something that I'd like to see change such that people are not bound by that rule so they can easily jump on a bike. The other thing is that the, pub the public bike share scheme needs to be linked into the public transport system. It's run on similar kind of technology as, dare I say it, the MyKey smart card that runs our public transport network. But if you were able to walk up to the bike share scheme with your MyKey card and not have to wear a helmet, you might give it a go. You might walk up, swipe it, take it for a spin, drop it back somewhere else, and get involved in cycling as a public mode of public transport. So with regards to public transport, yes, we need investment. We need more money, more trams, more trains, more buses. We need to abandon timetables. I mean, who cares about the on-time arrival of Yarra trams? We want trams, trains, and buses coming at a frequency that we know when we get to the stop, there'll be one coming soon. We need to connect our traditional public transport network into the broader world. We need all of our trams, trains, and buses to be connected to the national broadband network and, give it, and be wireless hotspots, giving us access to all of, all of our communities and online information as we travel. Another part of this expanded, integrated public transport system needs to be the car. Because, as I said earlier, if you don't, if you don't provide people access to a car when they need one, because cars are really great sometimes, 
when we really need them. If you don't offer, give them a solution to that, they're going to continue to own private cars. So some of you may know a flexi car, the car share service that I set up. And if not, I'll give you a quick rundown on what car share is. So car share is kind of similar to the bike share scheme, but you join up as a member, you get a smart card. Again, another smart card system that's the same as the MyKey system that could be integrated. And once you're a member, you make bookings online, you walk up to the car, dot it around your local neighbourhood, swipe your, your flexi card across the screen, it unlocks the doors, deactivates the engine, you drive it around for the period of your booking, bringing it back to the same location and swiping out, paying for it by the hour. Now, if we could link that in to the public transport network, in with the MyKey system, that would open that up to so many more people. If your details of your driver's licence sat on that, on that system, you could not only use a bike, a tram, a train, a bus, you'd also have access to a car. And there's much more interesting and innovative ideas happening in the car share space. I was really fortunate enough to spend a couple of months overseas on a Churchill Fellowship, and there's some exciting logistics and technological advancements that is making like a, a floating pa uh, swipe and go type car share system available, where you don't have to pre-book, where you just wa walk up and swipe, where you don't have to return it to the same location. You can leave it at another location across town, swipe out and go. So imagine if every car on the street was part of this extended, integrated public transport network and all the private cars had to park off street in private locations. Imagine just walking out onto the street and just swiping into any car you need, off you go, drop it off at the other end and pay by the minute for the use of that vehicle. The other thing I'd like to see in the expanded, integrated public transport network is that taxis and car rental be brought into this one platform. We currently pay for both of these by credit card at the moment, but we could, we could use this same, same system. And taxis are great. I mean, when you're drunk, they're the best thing. <laughs> and car rental's great because, you know, you're going to need longer trips out of town. You're going to want to go away uh, for the weekend for longer trips. And you, could, you can then use all sorts of cars, four-wheel drives for the trip, to, trip out to the bush, a mini if you're going down the Great Ocean Road. So if you had this all on one platform, a one integrated system where you could pay and access all of these range of services, you'd have all your transport needs in one. You wouldn't need a private car. Now, I know some of you are saying, well, you know, my key it's been, hasn't been great and why would we want to fit with that? And you're all techie as well, so you know that we've actually already got a device that could actually handle this. We've all got, not all of us, but we're increasingly all have mobile phones, smartphones. These phones could be used to connect us to all these different forms of transport, allowing us access and doing the billing. And at the, end of the, at the end of the year, we could see the cost of all of this, and I can assure you it'll be far less than owning a private car. And much more fun, because you get to drive all sorts of cars, and not just your own, you know, whatever old beatbox that you might have. So, so that's an expanded, integrated public transport system. Thirdly, I'd like to talk about cars done differently. So I think there will be still private cars. Unfortunately, we've designed our cities with lack of public transport investment, no, poor access to being able to walk and cycle to the things that we need to access each day. So we are going to see innovation in, the, in our vehicles. And yes, I'm excited that, the, that they will be electrified and they will no longer be uh, producing CO2 emissions. But the other innovation that we have in private cars that's emerging is ways to use those private cars more efficiently. Social networking sites and, and um, smartphone applications enabling people to ride share, to log where they're travelling from, where they're going to, where they can meet up with someone, where they can jump in and share the costs across that as well as peer-to-peer -peer car sharing, which is a concept that's emerging in, in the United States and Europe at the moment, where it's a marketplace. You've got a car, private car, put it up on the site, someone else who wants to rent, 
and you can match up and share, share the costs of your private car. Kind of like Airbnb for cars, if people know Airbnb. The fourth part of the, of the, of the innovation I see is air flights with more upside and less downside. Obviously, flying creates great opportunities for us culturally. It also, whilst we have Skype and FaceTime and they're great and we can connect across the globe, there is nothing like being able to visit family and friends and loved ones on the other side of the planet and to also share culturally the differences around the globe. But we have to do it differently. We can't continue to do it with CO2 emitting aeroplanes. Now, I don't know what the answer is of how we're going to power those planes, but I know we have to do it so it's got more upside and less downside. And the innovation in the automotive industry has, has, has to be encouragement for the, for the uh, airline industry to, to follow suit. So that's, that's, that's the, um, my summary. So one, active transport. Two, expanded integrated public transport. Three, private cars done differently, four, air, air flights with more upside than down. There is actually a fifth that I have been contemplating and wondering about, and it's a bit out there. In fact, it's way out there. It's actually about space travel. And I've been thinking, you know, how can we get to space so we can see that beautiful image of the Earth from space. You know, that might help us realise that we're over-consuming. That might help us realise we have to innovate, we have to use the technology we have, and we have to create behaviour change. But I don't know a way to get to space that isn't massively CO2 emitting at the moment. So all I can say to you is, let's hold that image of the Earth in our head the one that we see from space, know that we've got nowhere else to go, and use that to help us use the tools that we have to create a future where maybe if we get this right, some bright person in the future will work out a way of how to transport us into space. And we can sit there out in the galaxy, staring back at Earth, knowing we've got nowhere else to go, but really happy and pleased and proud that we did what we did, we innovated, we used our technology and we created change so that we could return there and be very happy. Thank you. <laughs>